Okay, well, we might get started then. First of all, welcome everybody to Casey Cardinia Libraries. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which this event is occurring and pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who may be watching. This evening, we are very fortunate to be hosting the wonderful Fiona McIntosh, who is here to tell us all about her new novel, The Spy's Wife, which has just been released. The novel takes us from the windswept moors of the Yorkshire Dales to the noisy beer halls of Munich and grand country estates in the picture book Bavarian Mountains. It's a lively and high stakes thriller that will keep you second guessing until the very end. Also tonight, we have some giveaways. We have a copy of The Spy's Wife for one lucky viewer and also the chance to win a beautiful Hermes silk scarf to another lucky viewer tonight. To be in the running to win one of these prizes, you will have to answer a question, which we will reveal at the end of the event and email your answer to, in, it's in a nook with a book, which is our Facebook group, so I-A-N-W-A-B at cclc.vic.gov.au. Courtney will pop this email address in the chat so that you can make a note of it. And um, yeah, two people will be very lucky winners tonight. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, this event is being recorded. And if you do not wish to be seen, please feel free to turn off your camera. And I also ask that you remain muted until the end of the event when there'll be an opportunity to ask Fiona any questions that you've got. Um, you can elect to ask them personally by putting up your hand, which is in the reactions button at the bottom, or you can just pop your questions in the chat and I'll relay them to Fiona on your behalf. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful Fiona McIntosh. Thank you very much, everyone. How wonderful. I've just put my 30 minute marker on because I want to make sure that I don't keep you all too late, um, but it is brilliant to be talking to you. I just wish I could be standing in front of you all. That was the plan, but um, we have to do the best we can do. And thank you very much for tuning in tonight. So The Spy's Wife, pretty excited about this one. Um, you're not meant to love your children more than each other, um, but I think I've written about 40 books now, so there's a lot to choose from. And of those 40, I would put The Spy's Wife in my top three. It just turned into this fantastic adventure that I wasn't expecting. I don't plan my books. My poor publisher never really knows what's coming. I give, give them a very loose arc to the story, um, and I don't tell them very much, not because I don't want to. Uh, it's because I don't know, because I don't plan. And so they just trust me. Um, very good of them, very generous of them. And off I go. And I end up with this story and I hope it's what they want. But I'm always surprised by what I end up with because I don't know how it begins. I don't know what's going to happen. And I certainly don't know how it ends. So this book has surprised me and delighted me. Um, so let's start maybe with where does an idea for something like this book begin? And for The Spy's Wife, I really have to take you back um, to when I was 19, and that was a very long time ago. I know it doesn't look it, but I promise you, um, it was a very long time ago. And I had just finished all my studies, finished my um, tertiary, and I was ready to hit the big smoke. And I began to commute. I lived on the other side of the world. Um, I was commuting between Brighton on the Sussex coast in Britain into London. Uh, so it was an hour's journey on the express train. And I knew that I didn't want to take the train that, that was a lot more social. Um, if you catch a train around about seven o'clock in the morning, it's pretty social. People are in the buffet car and they're laughing and they're joking. They've woken up and they're just a bit more lively. I wanted nothing to do with that gang. So I used to catch a train that was very early, about an hour earlier in the morning. And it meant I had to get up with the birds 
But that was okay. I was prepared to do it. And I step into this carriage. I had a particular carriage I liked. And I was traveling with all the stockbrokers, the bankers, the lawyers. They were all in their very stuffy and stodgy pinstripe suits. And I know when I first burst onto the scene, they were a bit frightened by me because I was all, you know, I'd lip gloss and perfume and bright colors and it frightened them. You know, they just didn't know what to do with themselves. And so, but they got used to me. And what would happen is they'd flap their newspapers and everybody would be reading and then they'd fall asleep within about 15 minutes because it was very early in the morning, but not me. Um, I was probably the youngest person on the train and I would get out a book and I would devour that book and I'd have this wonderful one hour on the way there and one hour on the way home each evening to just read. And it was a most brilliant time. And I I used to read three or four books, maybe five books a week. It was superb. Now, one of the books I read, and I'm sure some of you will know it, was written by the great storyteller Ken Follett. And he wrote a book called Eye of the Needle. And I absolutely adored it because it was such a thriller. And you were traveling with the villain the whole way, really. Um, and you were sort of on his side, but... He, you could, you didn't want him to succeed, and yet you felt this empathy towards him because he was being hunted. What it taught me um, was that something I had never known before through all my school years of studying uh, the Second World War is that we had German spies in Britain during the 1930s. I had no idea about that. It obviously sat in my mind like a little seed waiting to be watered, and four decades later, in 2019, when um, my publisher and I were talking about what am I going to write next, I just threw it out. I think I want to write about spies and I want to write about a spy in England. And she said, oh, that sounds fabulous, you know. And she said, what, a German spy? And I said, yeah, a German spy in England, but in the 1930s. And I said, but I want to mirror that by having a British spy in Germany in the 1930s. And I want to blur the lines between the two of them so that you sort of are frightened to trust, hand over your trust. So as the reader, you're a bit unsure what is going on and where is the treachery? Where's the betrayal gonna come from? And so we set off with nothing more than that. So I had to, I, I love the whole idea, I love the whole premise of it. And I had to try and work out, well, who are these two people? So I decided that my heroine, my lovely girl, was going to be Evie, who is a railway station master's daughter in North Yorkshire. And they're on a branch line. So it's a real sleepy hollow where not many people go. It's mostly holiday makers going to the seaside towns of Whitby and Scarborough, these sorts of places. Um, and the Ramblers. Now, there's a thing in England where you can, you know, you have the right to walk across the land. I mean, Ramblers have this right. And so loads of Ramblers, they began in the 1930s, just traipsing all over the Yorkshire Moors. And why wouldn't they? They're utterly beautiful in spring and summer. So, um, she is this girl who is has never left Yorkshire. She's never really left um, her home. She's very happy in this peaceful life, but she has no romance in her life. And she's beginning to notice this lovely stranger, this southerner who comes up from London now and then. And he always goes for walks on the moors. And she's intrigued by him, but she's as reticent as he is. They notice each other, but they're not going to make conversation until one day they're sort of flung together. And so this marvellous romance develops. And I don't want to say too much more about it because I know that I don't, I don't want to spoil it because most of you haven't read the book yet. Um, and it's from that moment that she meets Roger that her life is turned on its head. So from this wonderful, peaceful, quiet life, um, working in the station with her father in the parcels room, ticket office. She runs the kiosk and she, um, you know, she bakes her cakes, um, which she serves for morning and afternoon tea. It's very quiet little life. It is suddenly catapulted onto a world stage. And I won't tell you exactly why, but she is suddenly thrust um, into a situation she should never have found herself in. She's not qualified to be playing the role that she is cornered into doing. 
um, but lives are at stake. And the st so that makes the stakes pretty huge. You know, her life is at stake and two people that she loves, their lives are at stake. And so she goes along with this plan and it's traumatic what they expect of Evie. Um, but I love this character because she is so simple and so quiet and so reticent, but she's got this quiet strength. And out of this strength, with no qualifications to be a spy, she lives off her wits and she is thrust into Nazi Germany. And her job, without spoiling anything, is to prove that Germany is going onto a war footing. Now, in 1936, which is when the whole story is set, um, and this is deliberate, I should backtrack a little bit. When I was talking about this with my publisher, we both agreed as 2020 was rolling around that we just had the bushfires in um, Australia. We were all pretty down and we were also hearing about this virus that was come that was in China at the at the time it was all contained you know but it was it sounded frightening you know um, it it just looked pretty like a a bit of a horror movie and so we decided what we did not need was a war story at this stage you know just at the turn of that 2019 going into 2020 and I agreed because the previous book I'd written called the champagne war was all about war very emotional very um, sort of heart-stopping kind of story in a dark trench, uh, you know, battling in the trenches sort of way. And so we agreed, let's bring this story into the light. Let's make it a more cheerful situation. It didn't have to be um, cheerful in the sense of what the story was all about, but we just wanted the reader to feel full of suspense and full of tension, but not uh, weeping, you know, as they might have been in the Champagne War. And so I deliberately set it in 1936 because I, the Great War was done and was now memory. The Great Depression, um, everybody was emerging from the Great Depression of the late 1920s and early 30s. Spanish flu was done with. And by 1936, people are beginning to feel very optimistic. Only the reader knows what is coming in a few years. But the cast in the story, they all of, of the opinion, the Germans would never do this again. You know, Europe will never go to war again. But of course, we know different. Anyway, so 1936, I also set it deliberately in summer. I wanted everybody frocked up in bright colors and going on picnics and really enjoying the outdoors and the sunshine. And that's all part of delivering to the reader this more um, sort of uh, oxygen filled story that, that feels bright and sunny and shiny, but it is against the backdrop of the rise of Hitler. Because in 1936, Hitler had been chancellor for three years and he was declaring himself as a dictator. You know, by 1936, they were rearming. They were saying to hell with the Treaty of Versailles, where, where the Luftwaffe, we're putting money back into our air force. We are remilitarizing, uh, you know, our army is, is becoming strong again. We're filling it with uh, young men again. Um, and so it was a very touchy time in Germany and people in Whitehall back in London were beginning to feel very unnerved about what exactly are the plans of this new leader of Germany. And so this is what Evie is being flung into. Bring proof that Germany is on a war footing or not. And that's a very big thing to ask of a young woman with no experience, but it turns into this massive adventure that I wasn't expecting. I thought it was going to be very domestic and very small about, you know, somebody discovering somebody's a spy, but it just launched itself. And there's a point in the story where Evie really straps on her James Bond. And I, am, I was astonished at where she went and what she chose to do and how she got herself into a very tense situation that most of us probably wouldn't have had the courage to do. But it is fear that is driving Evie for this whole story. Um, it's the fear, it's from the fear that she finds the courage 
um, to do all the things that she does. Because the rest of Germany, where she is, the rest of Germany, they're all enjoying the summer of 1936. This is the time of the Summer Olympics in Berlin. This is the time of Night of the Amazons, which is this massive spectacular that Munich used to hold to sort of parade the beautiful young Aryan bodies of the German race. Um, it was the time of the Nuremberg rally, the very important Nuremberg rally, because that was the rally where um, Hitler unveiled the new Reich um, battle flag. So come September, and this story is set in July, come September, he had declared himself. He had his tanks and his marching parades marching under that new banner that was saying to the rest of Europe, we're coming. I, I, I want Germany back to being this powerful nation again and no longer the beggar of Europe, which is what had happened. Um, and I, I suppose when the research began, one of the big questions for me was, how could Germany, this glorious nation, uh, and particularly Berlin, which was the most liberal city in the whole world, it was where um, all the misfits, all the creative people, all the um, really arty and out there sort of folk, musical and, um, you know, uh, all, all the different arts, theater, they all found themselves in Berlin because that was the place you could really be yourself. And no one made judgment. You could just go there and be yourself. And almost within a couple of years, Berlin had changed and it had become this super conservative, really right wing, hard nosed kind of city that persecuted people for not giving the salute the right way, not lifting their hand high enough, not not um, bowing and scraping the right way. I mean, it was just traumatic what was going on. And of course, the beginnings of the Holocaust, we didn't know it as the Holocaust then, but um, the Jewish people, the gypsy folk, the Roma um, and invalids, all these people who were slightly on the outer, they were beginning to feel the effects of the Nazi ideology. So this is the backdrop that Evie finds herself thrown into. And I found that a very interesting playground to set this story against. Um, so, and the, the, the not funny part of it was, I didn't know about COVID at this, this stage. And at the end of February, 2020, off I went to Europe on behalf of all um, my readers to say, right, well, I've got to go and gather up all this material. Now, normally I do visit all my locations um, not once, but usually twice. I like to go back a second time. And if need be, I might go back a third time because I like to write in layers. You know, I like to get the story down because I have no plan. So once I know the main arc of the story, I like to go in and layer in stuff. And often I'll think, well, I'll just go back to Paris or I'll just go back to London and I'll learn a bit more about um, such and such or this or that. And then I can layer that into the manuscript as I go along. Um, and for the Champagne War, for example, I went back to France into the Champagne area four times to just get that story so right. And I think that's why it was such a deliciously rich tapestry for that story. And of course, I expected to do the same for The Spy's Wife. But in March 2020, when we were there in Germany, we had been to um, Berlin to get the Berlin scenes, Munich beautiful Bavaria to get the scenes all through Bavaria, Stuttgart and Nuremberg, um, because I thought I was going to bring a, one of the big rallies into the, into the story. Um, I, I remember we were sitting there and just uh, having a beer because I, I needed to know what the different beers tasted like so I could put it in the story. And I don't drink alcohol, so it was quite a challenge for me to taste all these different beers. Um, we began to feel very unnerved about what was happening in Europe. We could feel the change coming on. And we decided, um, I remember saying to my husband, do you know, I think we should go home. We really don't want to get stranded here because Italy was shutting down. London was still being quite blasé, but Germany, we were noticing, a, a, we could just feel it. And so I said, come on, let's just go. And we made a dash for the airport. And I tell you what, we got home, we must have been one of the last flights and they closed the gates of Australia on my big bottom, I think. And that was that. So I had that one trip into Europe to be able to, to get this story. And I was 
quite frightened. I thought, have I got enough material? As it turned out, I had too much material. Um, we never did get to Nuremberg in the story, but it was good to have that knowledge. It was very helpful for me to know what was coming through that summer for the German people. But I did send out an SOS um, and said, I need help. I need, I haven't, there are layers and textures to this story. I, I need to put in and I, I need some help. And this glorious little group of historians in Munich um, contacted me and they said, look, we've seen your SOS and normally we sell our services, but we love what you're doing and we can see how trapped you are. And we love Australians anyway. So how can we help? Ask us anything and we'll either go and find it in the archives or we'll track it down for you. And they were brilliant. There wasn't a question I asked them that they couldn't answer. And I was asking very obscure um, items. It would be something like, what would the jail in this precinct, such and such a precinct in Munich, have looked like in, you know, June 1936? And they were able to go and find that out for me and come back and say, the walls would have looked like this, the tiles would have looked like that, the uniforms would have looked like this. They were amazing, amazing. So uh, my hat's off to the, that wonderful team in Munich that just rallied for me. One interesting uh, item for this story is that I really wanted to bring Hitler into the story. I had read so many books about Hitler, because the question that burns in all our minds surely is how? How does a man, a very ordinary little man like this, get to wield such power and such vicious, cruel power? How did these broad-minded Germans um, every and everyday people like us, how did how would we let something like that happen? How did they let something like that happen? And so I'd read so much about this man. And of course, just as an aside, if only he'd been any good at watercolor painting, which was his first love, he just wanted to be an artist. And if the Academy of Arts had let him in, the Second World War would not have happened. I mean, isn't that crazy? But um, he wasn't very good at watercolour painting, and so he couldn't sell his sketches. And so he turned more to, he became this very embittered sort of uh, young man who was searching for something. And he realised he understood politics and he knew how to manipulate people. And from there it went, which is horrific to think about. But anyway... I really, I'd learned so much about him that I wanted to bring him into the story, but I didn't want him to look like a caricature of the man that we all know. I didn't want him to be this shouting, angry, um, short, uniformed man. I wanted him to be different to how we normally see Hitler. And my editor, I was telling my editor this, and she said, well, go on, I dare you. Just bring him into the pages as an ordinary man. And I thought, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that challenge. And so I did. And I found out that his um, favorite, um, I want to say coffee shop, but it was called a tea rooms. His favorite cafe to go to was called the Carlton Tea Rooms. Um, and this was in Munich. Now Munich was Hitler's playground. Munich was where Hitler went to, to relax, to socialize, to meet his friends, to have, um, cocktail parties. He was he wasn't a very social creature, but you know he he had friends and he he liked to go out now and then. But wherever he went in Berlin, he was so instantly recognizable. And he that was the workplace. That was where he did his work, and he was always in his you know um, uh, uniform and being very serious and grave about everything. But in Munich, he would laugh. In Munich, he would have fun. He had his house there. He had an apartment there. And so I've set the story in the same sort of neighborhood. So where he lives, so do my characters. Um, and they can often see his uh, driver and car there. But I have my main character, Evie, meeting Hitler in the Carlton Tea Rooms. And it's just fleeting. It's a very brief meeting. There's no conversation, but there is this look that is exchanged between them. And you know, when it happens, it's chilling. It's utterly chilling. And I couldn't believe I'd pulled it off. And when my editor read it, she said, it, I love that scene. It's so fabulous and so 
underplayed. The whole thing is so underplayed, you make no big deal of it. It just happens and they go their separate ways. And she said, it's magnificent that you were able to pull that off. So that's just an aside. I really wanted to walk him into my pages because I've never written a story set in Germany before. I've written many war tales that talk about Germany, Germany, the sort of the villain, but I've never had the story in Germany where we meet everyday people um, going about their business. Now, talking of villains, um, the villain in this story is a woman. And I didn't, again, I didn't want this villain to be somebody who's a brute or, you know, um, shouting and all this, no. She's a, a very elegant creature and she's incredibly cunning and incredibly vicious um, with that cunning. And I found her like this perfect counterbalance to Evie, who is all, she's straight, she's honest, but she's having to lie. She's having to put up this persona that is not her. And she's this wonderful counterbalance. And it's these two women sort of squaring off all the time, sort of testing each other like fences, you know? They're touching swords and trying to find where is the weakness? Where am I going to strike? So that's just another aspect of the story that I just loved having these two women going into battle against one another. And they both love the same man, which only adds an extra layer of tension to this, um, this sort of, loathing that they have for each other now how's my time going oh I've only got I've got about five minutes what else can I tell you where am I going to armchair travel you to I am going to armchair travel you to the beautiful moors of Yorkshire uh, I mean I'm completely seduced by Yorkshire I love it and I do tend to want to keep going back there um, I've set three books there now. Um, well, they've got, they've got scenes there, but this time we're really there and loving it. And this branch line really exists. Levisham Railway and Station really exist. And I've been talking to the railway master's wife, um, and she's helped me with all the background to this story. But I have been to the station a couple of times. And for those of you who watched Heartland on television, that's the branch line that it's on. Heartland was shot around a place called Gothland. And Leversham is just down the road from Gothland. And I'm going to take you to Scarborough Beach, which is a famous beach in Britain, where the northern holidaymakers used to go. And there's a beautiful few scenes there. Then we're going to go to London um, and meet the mandarins of Whitehall that are putting pushing around the chess pieces and Evie is one of them. Uh, we will drop into Paris because I love Paris. So I'm going to drop you into Paris and we're going to have um, a little while there. And then we're going to um, head into Munich. Now, I you will visit Berlin, of course, but I felt that Berlin uh, was a bit bit stereotypical for a story set in Germany. So I wanted to walk away from the, the, all those very familiar places in Berlin. Um, and I didn't want swastikas hanging everywhere and all that sort of thing. I wanted to get away from that. So I chose Bavaria. Now, I personally love Bavaria. The countryside is very much, you know, meadows and beautiful hills and flower covered um, drifts of, uh, you know, hillsides and things like this and fairy tale castles. And I thought, yeah, this is for me. And Munich itself is cobbled streets and really gorgeous. And so I thought, yeah, Munich is. And then I found out it was where Hitler loved to go as well. So we spend a lot of time in Munich and we spend uh, critical scenes in Stuttgart. Um, something happens in Stuttgart and the characters in that they walked out of nowhere. I had no idea the family we're going to meet in Stuttgart is such a famous family, a real family from history. So, and you will know who they are when you meet them. Um, uh, so that was fun. And I had to be careful how I handled that. Now I did go to Nuremberg and I thought I would have a rally, but we didn't get there uh, in the story. There was just too much story. Um, so that's really the geography that we're gonna cover. Um, Evie, there's lots of steam trains around just to sort of uh, make it very romantic. And I decided I would put Evie on the Orient Express for the readers. So you, you get a real feel for the Orient Express and, um, you know, this whole luxurious time of elegant steam travel. Um, 
I'm, I'm mindful that I don't have a lot more time and I don't want to just keep talking and talking. What are, oh, the main motive for the story. I think I've got two minutes left. The main, <laughs> have I? <laughs> you're, you're fine, Fiona. Okay, okay chatting away. Um, the main motive for the story is um, cherries and cherry blossom. Um, it came about because I, I wanted Evie to be a baker in the story. She's baking for the kiosk for the, at the railway. And um, I decided she would make cherry cakes because it sort of comes into the, it's quite clever how I use that in the plot. Um, and I wanted her to use her own cherries. So there are cherry trees growing um, just below the platform. And so we've got these beautiful confetti of petals that are in the story. The fruit is a motif um, going into the cakes and for spring and summer. But also I decided to use um, cherries on the scarf that Evie um, wears. Now, I got the idea for this scarf when I went through the Spy Museum in Berlin. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, the spy, we've been, spying is as old as, I don't know, prostitution. People have been spying since, um, you know, uh, the ancient Greeks, and they were using really cunning method, methods to transfer information across big distances. And I picked up lots of ideas, and one of them was a scarf. And this particular scarf was used in um, during the Second World War. And when you tied the scarf up, it, it just looked pretty. It didn't look like anything out of the ordinary other than being a pretty scarf. But when you undid it and laid it out, it was a map. And it was a map of the area where these spies had to get to. And I thought, oh, that's so clever. But I didn't want to steal that idea. But I stole the scarf and I used it in a, a more creative way for Evie. And it, I decided it would be an Hermes scarf. And that's why we are giving away Hermes scarves. Um, and I, somebody who's um, watching tonight will be a lucky winner, I hope, of that Hermes scarf. And it's beggared Penguin. I know the poor marketing um, person who had to put the, all these scarves on her credit card had to go and see the accountants and explain herself for this enormous cost that suddenly went down. Because Hermes, I would love to own an Hermes scarf. It's right up there with a Birkin bag or, you know, these sorts of things. So whoever wins it, you've got a treasure coming your way. So look after it and enjoy it. Um, and, but, but that's the history of the scarf. And the cherries are on the scarf. And they become a really pretty, beautiful motif throughout the whole story. Look, I'm told my 30 minutes is up here. So maybe... If I've been talking enough, I can take some questions from all of you. I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Fiona at the moment? Come on, gang. Where are you all? <laughs> well, while you're all thinking of oh, – have we got any? Well, I was just um, asking – Oh, are we allowed to talk or do you want it in the chat? No, you can speak. That's fine. Um, Fiona sort of said that, uh, Fiona, sorry, you, you said that your stories, you have no idea where they're going. Um, so what suddenly comes into your head to, to put you in a certain direction? I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, I know. It's a really, it frustrates a lot of writers when I do say that because a lot of writers do plan quite carefully. They know what's coming in each chapter and they like to almost leap, you know, jump from chapter to chapter based on what their plan is. I try really hard to plan because I think a good writer would plan what they're going to write. But the minute I step outdoors and I think, right, I'm going to go for a long walk and I'm going to plan my, and I, you know, off I go. All I'm thinking about is Colin Firth in a in a wet white fencing shirt climbing out of a lake or Daniel Craig in James Bond or something like that. My mind just will not let me plan. It just goes to very handsome men for some reason, which distresses my husband to hear, but that's, that's how my mind works. And so I think what happens is, and I know it sounds a bit weird, but I think back of brain takes care of business for me. So I sit down and I write the, the day's writing. And when I shut off for the day and I'm, I don't write all day long, I just write for a few hours. I think from there on, my brain is rearranging things and saying, right, 
well, tomorrow we will do this, but I'm not aware of it. So whilst I'm sleeping, all these little bit jigsaw pieces are falling into place. I come to my desk the next morning, my keyboard, and off I go. And I'm very impressed with myself that I've managed to write another, you know, three and a half thousand words and thinking, gosh, aren't I clever? I'm just so ad hoc. But I think back of brain takes care of business. What is coming into my head? I'm not sitting there and sort of like thinking, oh, what's coming? It just comes. So long as my fingers are on the keyboard, things are happening. And I tend to have the confidence, I suppose, to hand over to my characters and just say, all right, where are we going? And they do all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And, you know, deaths happen and people go missing and all sorts of troubles and traumas occur that I have not prearranged in my mind at all. And that's the truth. And sometimes when someone dies... Um, it might be a main character. I'm always very sorry that it's happened because I always say, well, that wasn't my fault. I didn't plan that. It just happened. Um, and I leave it in. And although it upsets a lot of people to lose a main character, it's just how the characters chose to go. So I don't know if that helps you, but it is a very, it's how I'm wired. No, thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Right, now we've got some questions in the chat here. Um, Tracy is asking, did you include the cherry cake recipe in your book? Uh, I, I hope we have. I, you know, I haven't even looked through my own book. Um, I hope we have. If not, I will publish it in my newsletter. Um, it's certainly in all the book club notes. We sent it out in a lovely sort of hamper that's going out to book clubs, and we've given the recipe there. Oh, and, wonderful. Yeah, I'll make sure anyone who wants it can have it. Now, Jen has asked, what are the other two books that you have written that are in your top three? Yeah, thank you. Number one, so The Spy's Wife would be number two in the lineup. Number one is The Pearl Thief. Um, that is the favourite book I've written of my own. Uh, I just can't help but adore this book. She is such a damaged woman. Um, and a bit like Evie, she has to find immense courage in the face of, well, such trauma, such danger. And um, it's an extraordinary tale and a very emotional tale. And it, I, do, I doubt I will ever write a book that affects me as profoundly as The Pearl Thief does, because she is a Holocaust survivor as well. Um, and so there's a lot wrapped up in that. Evie. Um, we don't touch on the Holocaust very much, but Evie is definitely protecting, um, you know, the, a couple of Jewish people. She's protecting their honour it throughout the story. But with the, uh, the Pearl Thief, it is all about being a survivor. So the Pearl Thief, number one. Number two, the Spy's Wife. Number three, I think it has to be the Lavender Keeper, which, um, oh, look, it's another spy, isn't it? For those of you who've read... Um, the Lavender Keeper, it's a young woman being recruited to be a spy and being dropped um, by parachute behind enemy lines in occupied France. And, you know, she's really not, she's had six weeks of training and suddenly she's got to be this brilliant spy. So I loved that. I love that about that story. So I think I just love thrillers. I think I like tension and suspense and people under threat all the time. Now, Joe has asked, does your husband travel with you when you are visiting places for your books? Yeah, always, always. We travel as one, actually, um, because Ian is an old uh, newspaper man. He's a journalist and a publisher of, you know, magazines. And he has quite a critical eye for certain things. He sees things that I don't necessarily pick up, whereas I'm all about the emotion. I'm, I'm picking up how am I feeling about what I'm learning, how am I feeling about this place I'm standing in? Whereas he's got that more dry journalistic attitude to it. Plus he plans everything. And one of these trips, um, they're not only very expensive, but I might go to maybe four or five cities in, in one hurtling rush. Um, and he's got to organize all the flights, all the trains, all the transfers, all the hotels, because I just don't have time to do all that. And, you know, you need somebody who's dotting the I's and crossing the T's because when things go wrong in travel, they tend to snowball. And mm -hmm. so um, he makes sure that we're absolutely on track with everything. And if things aren't quite fitting, he will refit it together and just say, don't worry, I'll set that up whilst you go out and do your day's research. By the time 
you come back, I'll have generated new tickets and we'll be, we'll be doing this or we'll be doing that. So I need that. I think I would find it very hard not to have mm. him. And also, um, Ian is brilliant as a sounding board. At the end of the day, research, I can just, you know, spill it all that I've learned or, and he'll say, but how is that going to help you? Or he helps me to sort of tease it all out and, and put it into a neat arrangement for myself. So I find him very reassuring to have at my side, even when he's maybe sitting in the hotel room and saying, well, you go off and do what you've got to do. Um, I just, I'm coming home to somebody. Otherwise it would be such a lonely mm. endeavor, I think. Um, and I, I just enjoy knowing someone's going to be there, you know, on a winter's night at the end of the day in a strange country. Yeah. Oh, no, definitely. And happy wife, happy life, let's face it. <laughs> now, Sue has asked, what do you like to read? Look, I love crime. That's my number one reading material. Um, I, I must admit, I read a lot of history, a lot of reference material for my stories, but I read such good writers of history that they read like novels. They read like stories. If you read someone like Anthony Beaver, who um, has written, I don't know, this many books about various aspects of various wars, you'll get completely sucked in like you're reading a novel. Um, and so I love the work of some of these historians that really know how to um, draw you in like a storyteller so that you feel like you're there. So I read a lot of reference material. Um, and for example, I told you I read loads about Hitler. I have to learn my um, my era, fashion, transport, you know, the cars, the buses that are on the road, what were people eating, what were they, how were they playing, getting their entertainment. Um, so I need to, what music were they listening to? I need to know all that. There's a lot of reading in that. But when I have some leisure time and it's time for me to just stop worrying about my books, I tend to pick up crime novels. Uh, I love a psychological thriller and I love a really good crime. Um, I tend not to read uh, a lot of historical fiction because I don't want to be influenced by other people who are writing into my genre. So crime for me is, you know, just delicious. And I, oh. I stream a lot of crime drama as well, uh, you know, on Netflix and AB, iView and those sorts of things. Um, I think we all like to read crime and we all like to watch crime. So it's one of those um, genres that fits alongside our first love. So if you love romance or you love historical fiction or, um, you know, crime actually sits quite neatly around them. Well, that leads me into a question from me. Um, as well as launching The Spy's Wife this year, you've also launched another book for your crime series featuring DCI Jack Hawksworth. And the, I believe it's been picked up for a small screen adaptation. That's yeah. exciting. Can you tell us a bit about that? It really is. Uh, I, I didn't know if this was ever going to happen for me, you know. And when you've written as many books as I have, you think, gosh, have they are they ignoring me or have they forgotten about me or whatever? But it just came out of the blue. And I wrote the first two Jack Hawksworth novels 10 years ago. And um, uh, we brought them out with a different publisher under a pseudonym, under a pen name. And I, I wanted it to come out under my own name, but they didn't think so. They thought it would uh, confuse people. And I think that's rubbish. I think people are very intelligent and can work out for themselves, you know, that I was writing fantasy, but also writing crime at the time. Anyway, we decided with my publisher now, Penguin, that we would re-release these books and see if people enjoyed them, knowing it was me that had written them. And it went gangbusters. And so they said, quickly, write another crime. So I wrote Mirror Man. And it was wonderful to step back after a decade into the footsteps of Jack Hawksworth. I realized how much I love him as a character um, and how much more story there was to tell. There were a few loose ends in the previous two books. There's an ongoing character and I needed to tie up those loose ends for the reader. So a lot of people were thrilled to know I was writing this third book. And when it was released, it went straight to number one in Australian fiction. So people were obviously gagging for it and we were just thrilled and delighted. And of course, it got me noticed by a global film company, uh, film and TV. And they approached me and said, look, we'd like to option the world of Jack Hawksworth, um, but we'd like to start 
because we were all in the middle of COVID at the time, they said, we need to start in Australia where you are. We need you to write a new book that's set in Australia so we can film. So I'm trying to get on now and quickly write a new Jack Hawksworth book that is set in Australia so that television land can get on with it. And then as all the borders open up and we all feel safer, we can start to look at how we do um, Jack back in Britain where he originates from. It is very exciting, I must say. Um, you know, I'm trying not to let it um, run away in my mind because options tend to take forever. I mean, it's all contracted, but they they take a long time to actually come to fruition. But it's lovely. It's a right step in the right direction. Oh, fabulous. Now, your research obviously involves, for your previous books, a lot of trips overseas. And of course, now, or over the last 12 months, you haven't been able to do that. So can you tell us anything about your next novel that you are writing and is that set in Australia? I can. Um, it's actually been two years that we haven't really mm. been able to travel. Yes. So, um, I take, I start my idea for a story um, more than two years out. So the writing was on the wall for me very early on um, last year and I could see that not only could I not travel, um, at the, at the time when we, I was having to make a decision about what I was going to write, the whole of Australia was locked down. And I couldn't even go to Tasmania, which was my first choice. I thought, well, I'll go to Tasmania and I'll write a book about, I don't know, apples or something. And, you know, I, I, felt, I felt like that would deliver to me a good story, but we couldn't cross borders. Mm. And even if I could, I'd have to quarantine or I couldn't come backwards and forwards to see my family. So it was a big no-no. And I realised with a sinking sort of horror-struck heart that I was going to have to write a story that was in South Australia. Um, and you know where you live, you tend not to take much notice of your of the beauty of your own landscape. You're always looking over the fence, aren't you, to other, other places and thinking, well, Paris is beautiful and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it had to be South Australia. And I had to turn around, look over my shoulder and think, what on earth am I going to write about that's based in Adelaide or within South Australia? And I managed to, I don't know where these ideas came from, but I decided I was going to write a story about a mortician uh, in Adelaide in the 1930s. Um, again, I wanted to keep it away from war. We were in the middle of a lockdown and I thought we definitely don't need a war story. So it's about a female mortician pushing the boundaries because in the 1930s, this was a male, fully male dominated um, industry and very much behind closed doors, very much part of the Freemasons, sort of almost secret. And there's this girl in the midst of it. And so I decided I would play with that idea, but I would bring her together with the story of a wool classer from Farina. Now, for those of you who don't know where Farina is, it's, you couldn't get more outback. It's in the far flung mid north of this state. You, if you drove, you know, it's about, um, I don't know, about 500 miles away. 500 miles? Yeah, it's about 500 miles, I think. Um, so it's a, it's a long way away and um, from Adelaide. And, you know, how was I going to bring these? My editor said, how are you going to bring a wool classer from there together with the mortician from Adelaide? And I said, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. So, um, but I have, and it's all written and I've delivered it. And she absolutely adores the story. And I've been very frightened because... I have never written an all Australian story before. I feel like an interloper. I feel like I'm treading into an arena I shouldn't because I was born on the other side of the world. I feel that the Northern Hemisphere is in my soul, but I've lived here for 40 years now. So everyone around me saying, nah, look, you're more Australian than, than a lot of people. <laughs> so just trust yourself and write this story. And so I did. I wanted to do it justice. I wanted to capture the Australian outback. Um, and I wanted to capture the 1930s port area of Adelaide and um, somehow I've managed to do it. And so that book is finished and delivered before The Spy's Wife came out, which is wonderful. So that means that I'm already working on uh, the second um, draft of it. And I'm also now really turning my attention to Jack Hawksworth. I've got to get that book written. 
and I've already decided what I'm writing for 2023. And my, my editor is very excited because it is another Australian book, but it will probably be set in Sydney. So I need all those borders open. I need to be able to come and go very freely so that I can write this um, Sydney based book. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Like. You'll be fine. No problems. You have a lot of loyal readers out here, so they will support you regardless of where you set your books, I am sure. Very grateful. Now, very I've, I've been fortunate enough during the year to interview some of your graduates from your masterclass on our Book Matters podcast, wow. and you're certainly producing some wonderful writers. And could you give our viewers a little brief overview about your masterclass? Um, look, the masterclass arose out of my masterclass. So when I was thinking about becoming um, an author, I needed you sort of you do need a guide because you don't know what you're doing. And I thought, well, I need someone to give me some advice here. And as luck would have it, Bryce Courtney was running um, his almost last masterclass. Um, it was back in 2012. And actually, sorry, telling fibs, it was back in the year 2000, I took his masterclass, which is five days, and it changed my life. It was like uh, the, the night before I was not a writer and the following day I had become this writer in my mind and it's all I wanted to do. I wanted to sell our business and I just wanted to become a full-time novelist and essentially that's what I did. And he really inspired me and told me that I was a writer I just hadn't written the book, so I need to go home and write that book. And I went home and I wrote a book very quickly, five weeks, I think it took me. I wrote a novel. I sent it off to the world's biggest publisher of that particular genre. And within two weeks, I had a contract for three books. And so it was like this crazy fairy tale um, coming true that, you know, one minute I wasn't a writer and suddenly I had a contract to write three books. And so I did, had to do a very public apprenticeship excuse me and you make a lot of mistakes along the way and you learn as you go and so when Bryce was dying he said to me I need you to take over this masterclass I need you to run it I need you to give your wisdom everything you've learned to new writers coming along so that's what I did in 2000 and he died in 2012 and in 2013, we launched the first one. And so next year, uh, next year but one will be our 10th anniversary. And we've got about, um, I don't know, 40, 50 writers out there selling books and about 25 of them are with the majors. So um, it's extraordinary what's happened. And during 2020, which you'd think would have been a tough year for everything, yeah, and it was, um, we got uh, six writers up with the major publishers in this mm. country. So they're all on debut. They're coming out right now. You know, it's very exciting. And so uh, I, I'm very thrilled. And they've the, we've got this big community now, 400 writers, um, and we're all in touch with each other every day. And I'm still in touch with the very first person and, and also the newest person. And I'm still helping them. I read their synopses. I suggest where they go with that when they're ready to submit. So it's a different kind of course. It's, it's not just one you do and I say, see you later, good luck. I'm still in touch with the people um, who came to the very first one in 2000. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Well, I've read some of those books of those authors and I'll tell you what, you're doing something right, Fiona, they're that's brilliant. for sure. Yeah, they're brilliant. They're all brilliant. <laughs> Thank now, you. does anybody else have any other questions at all? No? All done. Okay. Right. Now, the question that you need to answer to be in the running to win either a copy of The Spy's Wife or The Beautiful Hermes Scarf is... What is the name of the spy's wife? It's been mentioned a few times tonight. So that's all you need to do is to email our Inner Nook with a Book um, email address with your answer. And we will decide, we'll give you till the end of next week, say Friday night next week, and then we will do a draw the week after. And it's I A N W A B at cclc.vic.gov.au.
Oh, good luck. Okay. <laughs> well, Fiona, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk to all of our lovely patrons tonight. And I wish you every success with The Spy's Wife. And we will look forward to DCI Jack Hawksworth on the small screen. Can't wait till it actually happens. Absolutely. And thank you thank very you. much. And love to everyone out there. Thank you for dropping in. And I hope you enjoy thank The you. Spy's Wife. Thank you. Thank you.